Hi, everyone. Welcome to a co-production of We On and Voice of America. It is Friday. I am Susan Tehrani coming to you live from New York. Let's talk about some election issues from the administration of Donald Trump to the White House of Joe Biden. The United States policy on China has been mostly consistent with both presidents viewing China as America's biggest competitor. But in the race for the next president, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump have slightly different approaches toward the global superpower. VOA's Elizabeth Lee explains. These two presidential candidates clash on several topics, but Democratic and Republican nominees Kamala Harris and Donald Trump agree on one issue, the threat of China. Robert O'Brien served as national security advisor during the Trump administration. I think that the threat that we face from China is, is, is far more serious than we faced against the Soviet Union in the Cold War. O'Brien says the U.S. should deal with China through a show of strength. It's not just military strength. It's economic strength. It's diplomatic strength. It's, it's, it's soft power and cultural strength. That is what scares these, our adversaries. On economics, both the Trump and Biden administrations have used tariffs to counter what they describe as China dumping cheap products abroad, making competition tough for U.S. businesses. China is going to take over all of your business because of the electric car and because they have the material we don't. Trump is proposing tariffs of up to 60 percent on Chinese imports. Harris has also acknowledged U.S.-China competition. I will make sure that we lead the world into the future on space and artificial intelligence, that America, not China, wins the competition. She has supported some of the restrictions on trade that the Biden administration has supported as well, but she is certainly not a big tariff person. Analysts say Trump is more transactional. Probably my first call, I'm going to call up President Xi. I'm going to say you have to honor the deal you made. We made a deal you'd buy $50 billion worth of American farm product, and I guarantee you he will buy it. In the area of foreign policy, O'Brien says it's important to build alliances with like-minded countries. There was a time when America could shoulder the burden alone. We can't do it anymore alone. One expert says Trump has broken away from the traditional Republican foreign policy of establishing strong alliances. Trump is just viscerally not much into alliances and much more into what's in it for us. With election rhetoric ramping up over Chinese competition and security threats, some Americans fear the real losers may be Asian Americans and Chinese people living in the U.S., says Stephen Pei, who immigrated to the U.S. from Taiwan and works as a university professor. They consider U.S. is facing a threat, the whole society threat from China. Then it takes the whole society threat uh, response to deal with the threat from the faculty, students, researchers from China. I will be labeled because people cannot tell me. Am I from Taiwan or from China or from Korean? They're coming in from China. With Trump's tough talk, some Asian Americans worry about increased anti-Chinese sentiment if he is elected. But Asian American Republicans say they hope Trump, being a businessman, can make a deal with China that will benefit everyone in America. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News, Washington. VOA's Jessica Stone join us now with additional reporting live from Washington, D.C. Jessica, great to see you and happy Friday. VOA is reporting that the U.S. and China are planning a call between the presidents in the coming days. What can you tell us about that? Well, this is exclusive reporting from VOA's State State Department Bureau Chief Nike Ching, who writes that she and Biden last spoke uh, in April of this year, and they are now scheduled to speak in the coming days, uh, which was also intimated by um, Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, just last Friday, so a week ago, when he met with Wang Yi, the uh, foreign minister of China. They had agreed at that time on the importance of leader-to-leader communication, And we expect uh, the gamut of issues to be addressed, including fentanyl uh, precursors coming from China across the U.S. southern border and China's uh, interest in lowering the tariffs that uh, have been imposed on them thus far that you heard about in that piece. Uh, At the same time, Taiwan is sure to come up as well because Washington has authorized military assistance to 
to Taiwan of $567 million of the largest military package to date under the Biden administration. And Beijing considers Taiwan a breakaway province. So, of course, uh, they have already protested. We would expect uh, any meetings between these two leaders to address that issue again. And uh, Susan, I just want to explain why I'm in front of a fence outside the White House. This is in advance of the October 7th. Uh, protests that we anticipate to take place uh, around the anniversary of the Hamas attacks on Israel, which killed more than a thousand people. All right, Jessica, well, thank you so much for that. Speaking of Taiwan, the word now is that Taiwanese Air Force officers are training here in the United States on the new F-16 jets that are coming from the U.S. to help the island defend itself. Can you talk about that for us as well? Yeah, we're anticipating seeing 65 different Taiwanese Air Force officials coming to the United States for that training in January. They will be the trainers then for the rest of the Air Force. They'll be trained on how to operate those F-16 fighter jets that are coming from the U.S. as part of uh, the, the weapons agreements that have already taken place between Taiwan and the United States. This is going to cost Taiwan about a million U.S. dollars, and the plan is to have them train up on the jets and then turn around and be able to, uh, to administer training to the rest of the Air Force. Uh, Taipei expects to get a delivery of part of the order of those F-16s uh, by the end of the year, and the rest will come by the end of 2026. The goal for them is to counter the PLA's stealth fighters, which are already operational in that theater. And of course, we are seeing, uh, even around the, the National Day on Monday, the increased uptick of military activity in the Taiwan Straits. Taiwan's, it, it happens, though, at the same time where Taiwanese troops have been training at a specific military base in the state of Michigan, which is also where we just saw a large federal indictment of five graduate students from the University of Michigan, which were accused of, of getting onto that base to spy on those military operations, that indictment coming down this week in the U.S. Susan? All right, Jessica, please do stay with us. I'd love to get your thoughts on a story about the Middle East, the U.S., Involvement there in Israel as well, with Israel launching ground incursions into Lebanon and vowing consequences as a response to the barrage of missiles from Tehran. President Joe Biden is warning U.S. ally Israel not to allow the conflict to spread with Iran's other proxy, Hezbollah, in Lebanon and ultimately with Iran itself. White House Bureau Chief for Voice of America, Patsy Widakaswara, looks at the potential for further escalation that could drive the United States directly into war to defend Israel. Explosions in Beirut Wednesday in what Israel says are strikes on Hezbollah targets in Lebanon. In Damascus, Syrian state media says three civilians were killed in Israeli strikes Tuesday. More strikes were reported in the Syrian capital on Wednesday. On Tuesday, Iran launched 180 missiles at Israel, damaging a school in the Israeli city of Hod HaSharon and killing at least one person in the West Bank. Tehran says Tuesday's attack is in retaliation for the Israeli killing of leaders of Hezbollah, Hamas and the Iranian military. As Israel is preparing to strike back, President Joe Biden discussed the conflict with Group of Seven leaders Wednesday. We'll be discussing with the Israelis what they're going to do, but they have, all seven of us agree that they have a right to respond, but they should respond in proportion. Biden said he does not support Israel attacking Iran's nuclear site. The U.S. president has long warned Israel not to allow its war with Hamas in Gaza to spread to Iran's other proxy Hezbollah in Lebanon and ultimately to Iran itself. Israel this week launched ground incursions into Lebanon. It has threatened strikes on Iran and other countries where Tehran's proxies are located. This is true for Judea and Samaria. It is true for Gaza, Lebanon, Yemen, Syria, and it is also true for Iran. We fight the axis of evil everywhere. Washington fears further escalation could drag the United States directly into war should Iran retaliate back against Israel, especially if American interests are hit. And that would mean attacking oil-producing facilities in Saudi Arabia, for example. That could mean empowering uh, pro-Iranian groups in Iraq and Syria to attack American forces. Uh, and yes, the, it could provide an avenue, a pathway for the United States to get into this war. The U.S. is already involved in intercepting Iranian missiles targeting Israel. 
Whether Biden will use offensive capabilities to strike Iran directly is unclear. What is clear is that despite its calls for a ceasefire in Gaza and Lebanon, Washington has not succeeded in containing the conflict. The key drivers of events in the Middle East today are the players that are engaged in these combat operations. It's Israel, it's Hamas in Gaza, it's Hezbollah in Lebanon, and it's Iran and its networks across the region, including the Houthis in Yemen. The U.S. is been operating in a large to a large extent as a bystander and trying to constrain um, the worst outcomes and prevent the worst outcomes. Iran's Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei blames U.S. and European countries for the wars in the Middle East. If they rid the region of their presence, no doubt these conflicts, wars and clashes will completely go away. The White House has not responded to requests for comments on Khamenei's remarks, but said Tehran will be slapped with more sanctions. Pat Suida Kuswara, VOA News, Washington. All right, VOA's Jessica Stone still is live with us outside of the White House. Jessica, what are the latest steps Washington has taken to influence Israel to lower tensions? Well, we know from this week that uh, President Biden is working with the other G7 leaders on issuing a joint statement that will condemn what happened, but also to implement additional sanctions on Iran. And uh, the European Union is, of course, part of that conversation. Biden says he opposes Israeli strikes uh, on Iran's nuclear pro program, but he agrees that Israel has the right to defend itself militarily as long, he says, as it's, quote, proportionate. Washington wants to make sure Israel's response does not imperil U.S. interests. And so one possibility here is that we could see additional levels of enforcement by the U.S. government, as we saw under the Trump administration, of the existing Iran oil sanctions in order to really uh, stop sending or stop allowing as much money to come into Iran through its sales uh, to places like China and Russia. Back to you. The Pentagon has increased U.S. military presence in the Middle East as well. What does that look like and what's behind that motivation? Yeah, so we've seen uh, over the last five or six days an increase of uh, staffing up in the Persian Gulf of U.S. assets, including uh, the USS Abraham Lincoln Strike Group. It will stay in the region. And the U.S. has also added four types of fighter aircraft. They've added more troops and they've put more troops on alert to deploy to the region. The goal there to protect U.S. citizens and forces in the region. Of course, there are still uh, forces in Iraq, uh, in uh, parts of uh, the other parts of the Middle East that the U.S. needs to protect. And these assets were also part of the response that Israel had to those Iran uh, missiles. Some of these uh, these missiles were intercepted by U.S. assets. In fact, two US, U.S. destroyers, two U.S. destroyers, I should say, fired at least a dozen interceptors at those missiles. Susan. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for all of that, Jessica. And I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Have a good weekend. Thanks, you too. For all the latest news, download the WeOn app and subscribe to our YouTube channel.